Welcome to Your Next Mission podcast with the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army and co-founder of the American Freedom Foundation, Jack L. Tilly. Proudly presented by Cavalry Agency, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue University Global, and Veterans United Home Loans. Hello out there, warriors, past and present, and your families. And I want to thank you for all you do and all you continue to do for this, uh, this great country. I know the kind of sacrifices you make, and uh, I certainly appreciate it because just to let you know, I'm one of you. Welcome to Season 3 of Your Next Mission Video Podcast, a program initiative of the American Freedom Foundation. I'm Jack L. Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the United States Army, your host. I'm always pumped up saying that anyway. Before we get started, though, I, I want to personally want to thank our presenting sponsors. Calvary Agency, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue University Global, and Veterans United Home Loans for their generous support in making your next mission happen. They love our veterans and families, and as I always say, we love them too. We have a great show for you today. We're going to be talking to the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and what an honor it is for me to introduce him. Uh, please welcome the fourth, I'm gonna make sure I get that right, fourth senior enlisted advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Ramon C.Z. Colon Lopez. Welcome, so excited to have you on the show. Thank you, SMA, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Well, it's my, it's my honor to have you and I appreciate you taking the time. I know you got a, probably a pretty busy schedule. Uh, before we get into all the topics we wanna to cover uh, a little bit, uh, before we do that, can you tell the audience about yourself? Uh, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, well, SMA, real quick, you know, I came in in December of 1990, enlisted as a transportation specialist. Uh, shortly after that, two years to be exact, I uh, assessed and got selected for Air Force Special Operations Pararescue. Uh, did that for the better part of 20 years, uh, most of the time in the Joint Special Operations Command and uh, got selected as the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman on December of 2019. And uh, we have been fulfilling that duty ever since. What job did you come out of? What job was you in for you went up there to that job? I was the command senior enlisted leader at United States Africa Command. And I replaced uh, Command Sergeant Major Darren Bond. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know him real well. I've known him for years. He's, I think he still lives down in Miami, down there somewhere. But uh, he's he's a super guy. Uh, I, I know you're really passionate about addressing topics that affect our enlisted force, uh, which include maintain and improve. Uh, you know, the, really to have the most combat effective fighting force in the world. Let's start with uh, Ukraine and Russia the conflict. What is the role in the region of our really of our non-commissioned officers in that fight? Well, our non-commissioned officers uh, have uh, distal involvement and basically in the neighboring nations that are under NATO Article 5 authorities. Uh, we don't have uh, specific roles in the fight in Ukraine other than training uh, for those forces. But I would like to talk a little bit more about the role before the conflict. That is really the most important topic that very few people are talking about. Sure, go ahead. And so after the annexation of Crimea in 2014, the Ukrainian government decided to take a different approach to the development of their NCOs. They wanted to get post, uh, uh, past the post-Warsaw Pact model. They didn't want to go ahead and fight the way that they were accustomed to doing. So what they did is they enlisted NATO and the United States to go ahead and westernize their NCO development. And long story short is from the creation of a basic training institution to three academies to provide professional development, uh, combat arms training and special operations. They were quick learners in a span of five years where they created the force that you're seeing fighting the Russians today. And it is that particular model, that NATO model that ended up pushing them and uh, getting a competitive advantage against the Russians on the battlefield. A lot of it is because the NCOs are decentralized, they're autonomous, they're able to make decisions, and they're really casting a wider net of leadership in the field uh, as compared to the Russians where they solely rely on officers to make those decisions. Yeah, yeah. It's well, first of all, I'll tell you that I was a CENTCOM sergeant major for about three and a half years. So I worked through all through that AOR and I know exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about developing that non-commissioned officer corps and stuff. The other thing, I, which is uh, 
great that you just said it. I, I watched on television where he had uh, a, a column of tanks, Russian tanks got hit, and they all ran in single file getting away. And I was thinking to myself, if that was an army unit, they'd be dispersed and, and engaged. So there's a, there's a big difference, and you're really right. It's the, uh, it's the officers lead the Russian army versus the NCOs. You know, they don't, uh, I don't know if they have any authority at all. Uh, I work with them. Uh, and, yeah, go ahead. And they, they do they do not SMA. Yeah. Um, we were just talking. I had a conversation here just about a week and a half, two weeks ago, with my counterpart in the Ukraine, Alex Kaczynski. And uh, he was talking about that dynamic to where, you know, without officer leadership, the Russians really don't know what to do. Yeah. To where their NCOs are taking the lead, taking charge, and they're really uh, creating uh, phenomenal battlefield effects. Yeah. I, I, again, don't, I don't dwell on too much, but I remember I was in uh, Bosnia years ago, and, and they had the Russians down there. And uh, we gave, I can't remember, we gave them a briefing on something, and uh, they thought we was officers uh, that was, you know, Trying to be enlisted or something. I'm not sure what it's really sort of funny. It's, it's, it's good. Hey, what about your allies and partners? What's that relationship with? You know, you got you got you can't do anything by yourself. You gotta have a good relationship with the other countries. What about that relationship? We have pretty good strong relationships over there. We absolutely do. And when you look at the current national defense strategy and the reliance on partners and allies, I mean it's critical nowadays because as we move away from a, a localized battlefield. And we engage on a global scale with great power competitions. Mm -hmm. Partners are going to matter because we clearly are not going to be able to take on every task yep. we're accustomed to doing. But as the Ukrainians have shown, we have developed relationships over the years that are actually paying dividends right now. And we continue to do so. A perfect example are all the frontline nations right there on the border of, uh, of the Ukraine and Russia talking Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, Romania, every single one of them is really interested on the lessons learned in the battle in Ukraine so that they can go ahead and ramp up their training and be able to go ahead and sustain their sovereign nation. Um, also, it's not localized to the conflict that we have, like we like to say, the insurgent inside the wire. Yeah. We're working with partners in South America, in Africa, across the globe to make sure that if we and when we do come together to fight a common enemy, we're synchronized and we have habitual relationships and techniques, tactics, and procedures to be able to get after that fight. Oh man, I, you know, you just hit on a great topic. You know, it's, it's so important that they understand exactly how we fight uh, because we can't just, uh, I'm sure it's a lot different now, but just the radio communications, what we say, what acronyms. I mean, there's a lot of things we say, they don't say. The other thing, uh, I guess it's uh, when you get around other nations, though, you really see, uh, well, God, I want to brag in it, but you really see how good we are, you know, about about our educational level and how we developed a, just a wonderful non-commissioned officer corps and officer corps too, but but, but I'm focusing right now on the NCO corps, but, but it's, it's amazing. Uh, and and I'm, again, not cutting anybody down, but it's amazing how good we are and how professional our non-commissioned officers and soldiers are, and airmen and everybody else is in the battlefield or in that area of operation. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the strengths that we have in our military, and this is something that's been longstanding, and you know, since the creation of our academies in the 70s after the Vietnam conflict, when we really decided to put forth the professionalization of the NCO Corps, um, you know, we're empowered we have access and we have trust from our officers. Yep. To work. We're conducting a lot of things that in the past wouldn't even be fathomed by an enlisted person carrying on with those duties. At one point, the lead person in Syria was a non-commissioned officer, yeah, an yeah, E-9. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that is just the way we operate. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's I, I was, you know, I'm an old guy. I went through Vietnam and I went through that uh, development of Vietnam and I really saw how the uh, non-commissioned officer corps really lost that trust, what you just yeah. talked about, about, that trust and confidence. And you really had to fight to get it back. And it took us for years. And when we went to an all-volunteer army, uh, I think we got that trust back. I remember one time that, uh, that was sort of funny, I was uh, going to give PT and this lieutenant says, can you give soldiers PT? Do you know how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, I know. And so it, it really sort of made me mad, but I smoked the hell out of him then. So I, I, <laughs> I know. I, I was just about to say, you should go and get in line. I'll show you. I, well, he did. And in fact, I run him. So what was, I got, I, I'll be talking too much about this, but I ran so far. They said, well, can you give him the exercise? I gave him the exercise. Then he said, well, can you run two miles? Well, it just really angered me. I said, sure. And I was a staff sergeant. So I said, sure. And so was, and we moved out. I ran one mile. I ran two miles. I, ran, I think we probably ran four miles. 
at the end, when we came back in, there was only about five or six guys left, uh, and he wasn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I love that. Hey, the second topic I want to discuss about force fitness. I, I know this is one of your, you know, top priorities as well. Can you can you start with that personal story about the uh, brain health and recovery? I think it is that you that you want to talk. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely, uh, SMA and my journey, just like many people out there struggling to get help, was uh, one of denial. Uh, denial because of the. Uh, customs of the tribe, yeah. for lack of better words, the way that we cope with that stress, uh, the way that we hit illness because we didn't want to be taken off the line, yeah. specifically in special operations. And the fact that everybody was probably going through the same thing. So nothing seemed different mm -hmm. to a lot of us. And candidly for me, it took over 15 years for me to come clean about the issues that I was experiencing. Uh, when I finally did, uh, it was a huge weight off my shoulder. Um, I was, uh, I was like many people, you know, being untruthful in my, you know, preventive health assessments yeah. and post deployment health assessments, just like everybody. I only had two beers, ate all my vegetables and never smoked. You know? <laughs> and, uh, every time I, every time I have an alcohol and talk to, to the troops, I mean, they start laughing because they're doing the same thing. Yeah. And part of the reason is because we didn't have trust or confidence in the system to be able to take care of us as a human weapon system. But what I learned after I sought help and I went through NICO, the National Intepid Center of Excellence, and they told me everything that was actually wrong with me because there were things wrong with me, uh, both mentally and physically, uh, it was a new beginning to be able to go ahead and not only identify, recognize, but fix and also to develop a plan for the future, not only for my own personal effectiveness, but for the sake of my family. Yeah, you, you know, I was, uh, I'm glad you said that too, because I was overran once, 20 wounded, seven killed. I, you know, years ago, I remember stepping over bodies. I've seen people execute. I've seen a lot of stuff, just like you, I'm sure. And, uh, and it affected me. All of us have scars and some you just can't see. And, uh, and I, never, I never reached for any kind of help and I think I always tell people, I think the reason that I probably worked through a lot of the issues because I stayed on active duty. Uh, yeah. But even today, there's things, there's certain things that, uh, you know, if I'll, I'll say certain things that are got to be careful because I'll tear up and, and I don't know what goes wrong with my brain, but it'll never go away. I'll just tear up and it's hard for me to get through. So, you know, it's, it's a tough situation, but you're really right. Years ago, people wouldn't go to the medic or wouldn't talk to anybody, wouldn't talk to a doctor because they figured it affect their promotion. Uh, it affect their assignments. People look at it negatively about this stuff. And I think it's, uh, you know, like yourself or senior officers or senior non-commissioned officers that, that really go about and talking about those things, uh, you know, I think it's certainly important. We, you know, last year we really focused on mental health on, on our podcast. Can, can you really, can you talk about the stigma that's associated with that? I just mentioned a couple of things there, but uh, can you talk about that stigma that really is, is a folk about mental health when somebody does say something? Yeah, so you mentioned, you know, the the effectiveness or the perception of your leadership and yeah. uh, your toughness by coming uh, by coming clean or reserving the right to go actually get help, and pride comes into it. Yeah, and a lot of people are proud. A lot of people don't want to air out their financial grievances, their mental grievances, because they don't want to be perceived as weak. Uh, the system, as it is right now is one that actually makes you feel that way um, because of the short amount of providers that we have because of the track record and stories anecdotes whether true or not yeah that if you seek help you'll be put in the penalty box and after the penalty box you may get chaptered out uh, those are all fears that our people have because a lot of them depend you know on the employment that they have right now as a military service member so the direction that we're wanting to take with our system is health is health. There's no such thing as mental or physical health. We want your holistic health to be a part of the solution and your way forward. And we need to create a mechanism to where we treat the human weapon system just like we treat every steel weapon system. Absolutely. Whether it's a tank, a plane, yeah. a ship. We need to make sure that we send it out to depot every once in a while to go ahead and get a deep check to make sure it does not fail when we need it to happen. 
So that is really what Total Force Fitness is getting after. It is a depot for humans to be able to go ahead and make sure that they get periodically checked to make sure that the wheels don't come off at a point because we just put band-aids on an issue that needed surgery early on. I think the other thing though is, is uh, and, you, and you've hit it already, is the fact that you went and talked to somebody, is how do we convince people, uh, soldiers, airmen, sailors, all the rest of them, but how do we p teach them to go forward to their, uh, to seek help and assistance? That's, that's the hardest part right there. You know, I don't think, it, uh, it yeah, I don't hard. think they, I, well, I, I mean, I don't think people want to do that again for, for a whole lot of different reasons. It's just sort of tough for them to do it, yeah. It is hard, but I tell you what I've been doing. Uh, I have put my position on the line, just on, hey, look, you have my full backing on this. Go and get help, and I promise you that we will get you the help that you need and that will back you up. That has worked for many service members that have reached out to me because I've been pretty vocal about it, mm -hmm. about my dishonesty the relief that I have once I got help and how well I'm doing right now. My family will be the first ones to tell you that it's been a, a, a dynamic improvement on my part, on my behavior, on the way that I carry myself, and most importantly, on the things that I need to do as a husband, you know, as a brother, as a son, to be able to uh, make sure that I continue to function in society. Yeah. But uh, for the young people out there listening to the to the podcast, family members and so on, uh, encourage your loved ones to go and get help. And once again, I extend the olive branch that if you do decide to get help and you don't have confidence, contact me directly and I will make sure that I carry you through the process. Yeah, what, what, would, you, what would you tell senior leaders, or, or leaders at any level, doesn't matter what level, what would you say to a senior leader about, about this particular issue? Would you tell them that, you know, you gotta be proactive in it or whatever? Would you, what kind of advice would you give them, I guess? Well, the advice that I will give them is just give people the opportunity to find out what is troubling them. Mm -hmm. Now, the majority of the people that go to uh, behavioral or mental health, whatever you want to call it nowadays, uh, there are a lot of stressors that are driving them to go in that direction. It's not something clinical necessarily. You know, those, those are very few and far in between the mm -hmm. people that have a true clinical issue that needs to be uh, further looked at. What we're seeing is that all of these issues of sexual assault, substance abuse, spousal abuse, suicide is driven by stress. Yep. And right now, society has got a whole bunch of stress. Back in the early days when you and I were young people without knowledge for us in our heads, mm -hmm. um, it was the newspapers or it was the first sergeant giving us information. Now they're getting hit from a million different directions on he said, she said, they said, somebody said, nobody cares about you. Everybody loves you. No, we don't love you anymore because we just don't like you. All of these things create a different stress dynamic that is really affecting our, our young people. And we need to be cognizant of that, first of all. And second, we need to make sure that we keep the door open for them to be comfortable to get help. Yeah, you, you, you just, uh, you hit, again, hit on a great topic. You just don't know who to listen to. And uh, really, the first line supervisor, person you should be listening to, I think, are, are within your chain of command. But you're really right. There's so much information out there, and and uh, you know, it's just it's just really tough. One last question for we, the uh, the uh, I, I don't know about you, and you don't have to answer this question. I had anger issues when I come back for a little while. I mean, I I, I mean, I, I remember one time I was just stomping the crap out of a little motorcycle my kid had, and all of a sudden I realized I stopped and said, "Geez, what's going on?" And I and I really, quite frankly, couldn't figure it out. Uh, I think that's the hardest thing is, is uh, just what you said before here about being, I guess, uh, open enough to go talk to somebody, open enough to see exactly what's, because that's not normal behavior. You know, it's, it's just really, it's really hard. It's really sad because I, at one time, I don't know what the number is now. I remember I used to, years ago, I thought that, uh, uh, what is it, one in five or maybe it's two in five people that still on active duty have some form of post-traumatic stress. Uh, that that's associated with them, so it's it's just hard. It's a tough situation, but you know that's the that's the job we we signed up for, and they're doing just a, a great job. So, well, and the longer you uh, the longer you spend in combat, the more addicted you get to violence and adrenaline. Oh yeah, and that is really a, a big factor that affects the majority of our people. Yeah, and we just gotta let them know that hey, if you start experiencing the symptoms, we can speak from personal experience. Yeah, yeah. Go and get help. Don't wait too long because for me specifically, the wheels came off, man. Yeah. And, uh, nobody should go through that. No family should yeah. have to go through that. So. Yeah. I, 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 you, I'm again. The family is the one that that really see the effects of that. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you is, I think anybody that goes to war, your heart turns black. Uh, you know what I mean? 
because you, 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 I mean, you do what you got to do, and some of the things you do, you don't want to do, but you got to do them. You know, and it's, and it's hard for people. And that's why we're doing this show. We want to do a great job about not only educating the military about what the military does, but also educating our civilian population about the, the kind of sacrifices that our military makes. But uh, yeah, it's just, and, you know, it turns black, and hopefully it, it comes back the way it's supposed to come back one day, but, but some people it doesn't. You know, it's, it's, hard, to, uh, it's hard to cope. Uh, it's hard to cope with those changes. I tell everybody that goes to war, they come back different. Uh, I often tell people I went from 18 to 55 in war. You know, my wife just, my wife, my, my wife, my life just changed, and it probably uh, changed. Hopefully, I get back to ground zero. I'm, I'm going to go back to 18. That's for Don Carter, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're talking with the senior enlisted advisor, Ramon C.C. Colon Lopez. And you're watching your next mission video podcast uh, with me, your host, Jack L. Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major I'm in. And don't forget, if you're enjoying this discussion, if you're not enjoying it, something's wrong with you, please like us. Click on that uh, subscribe button below. Uh, I'd like to follow up on, on our discussion about the total force fitness. Can you talk about the, the current effort to make, I guess you want to make all the facilities available for all service members? Is that, is that your plan there? Uh, that is correct, SMA. And right now, the Army's got probably one of the best programs. Second, <laughs> <laughs> second, second to SOCOM, yeah. uh, the preservation of the force and families and that holistic approach that we took years ago yeah. to deal with the human weapon system. The problem that we have been seeing with a particular program is that it is not affordable on a larger scale. Yeah. But there's things that we can do in order to go ahead and mimic that dynamic to make sure that we continue to invest in our, in our people and their strength, their conditioning, and their resilience. So what the Army has done with the holistic health and mm -hmm. fitness is about as perfect as it's gonna come. Now, from the metrics to the facilities to the way that they have crack, crafted a group of professionals to be able to go ahead and help our soldiers be stronger, be faster, be smarter, be healthier, is the direction that we're gonna take with Total Force Fitness. Now, we're taking a lot of the lessons learned that the Army has uh, collected over the years. The Army currently has about 36 of the centers. They're, they're calling them wellness centers. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I think that we're gonna continue with that name because it's a, it's a known commodity across the force right now. There's a handful of them that have turned joint. One of them specifically here at Fort Belvoir, that if you go in there, uh, you come out feeling good about yourself because it is a non-judgmental environment. You go in and if you're fat and lazy, they teach you how to get in shape, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, and they give you the science behind your obesity and what you need to do, what you need to eat in order to get better. Yeah. If you're having problems running, they put you through a clinic to make sure that they teach you the proper way to exercise. Yeah. And if you're having stress, you talk with a counselor, not necessarily a clinician that needs a leather couch and an encyclopedia, you know, on the wall. These are people that I just there to help our humans be better, not only them, but their families. And I think that that is an affordable way to where we switch the preventative side of healthcare to where we're not we're not spending billions of dollars on stuff that we should have prevented in the first place when it comes to a medical cost for the department. Yeah, if, if you're physically fit on the battlefield, you're a combat multiplier, you know? Uh, because I tell you, if you're, if you're not, uh, I remember I, I used to tell people I used to run when I, probably when I started when I was a battalion, but I actually run, try to run five to six, seven miles a day, and I was really in pretty good shape. But I used to tell people in, in wartime, if you're not in good physical shape, there's a lot of stuff that you're going to have to do that you physically can't do it. For so, so uh, and, and a lot of your uh, special operations, of course, and a lot of your combat arms units and stuff stay in pretty good physical shape. But I was always concerned about uh, maybe other units that weren't in that direct fight. But nowadays, because of terrorism, everybody's in the fight. You know, you need to make sure that you're uh, physically fit to do exactly what you because you just never know what's going to happen. You know, you got to make sure that you're prepared to do whatever you have to do. Well, and I'll speak from my service as an example, man, because I'm pretty sure that when you were in, you went by a running track on an Air Force installation and you didn't see a damn body out there. Well, you seen him walking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, but you know, that, that culture changed it after 9-11. And you started, uh, people actually, they got to taste the blood in combat. And then they'll come back, oh, this physical fitness is important, not only because I need to perform, but because it will give me confidence out there that if something bad happens, I'll be able to perform. What? Yeah. And then that, that is without MOS, rate, yep. AFSC, yeah. 
man, that is that is uh, something that is critical for every single person that has to deploy forward in, in support of any conflict. Yeah. Because you don't know when the enemy is going to strike and you don't know to what uh, magnitude they're going to go ahead and try to inflict damage on that formation. I, I think the other thing, and uh, I think the other thing, you may want to talk about this a little bit, is the Guard and Reserve. The importance yeah. of them staying in good physical shape because uh, if it wasn't for the Guard Reserve, I know in the Army, if it wasn't for the Guard Reserve, we couldn't get our mission done because we had eight divisions in the uh, you know in the Guard and eleven in active duty. So, but but I know on that rotation, uh, the Army can't do it by itself. You know, none, none of the service. I mean, so they really uh, really help a great deal. And I think when you talk about physical fitness because of what their jobs are and what they do and all that other stuff, that's that's a little bit tougher. Uh, are you working with the Guard Reserve about the uh, the fitness part of that? Absolutely, and part of Total Force Fitness is to build in uh, healthy military communities for those uh, post base installations uh, or those people assigned to units to where they don't have a full base post or installation. Um, so that is part of the umbrella to make sure that the services are spread across all three compos, you know, the active duty, the reserve, and the guard, and uh, to make sure that we have parity because even, you know, we have to rely on, on the total force. Yes to go ahead and uh, execute uh, reaction to any conflict in the future. Yeah, one of the other things too is, is, is uh, you may not want to talk about this, but one of the things, I told the chief one time when I was on active duty, I said, if you want to get people, uh, the general secretary, if you want to get people to stop walking pack your office, uh, past your office, put a weight scale out there, right? <laughs> and and <laughs> maybe, maybe a little stop. Sometimes leaders forget about doing physical training, to be honest with you, especially the senior they get. Uh, it's tough for them to get out and exercise. But, so I think there needs to be a lot of emphasis placed on, you know, it's a little tougher, they're not gonna do as much probably, but, but making sure they're physically fit so they can lead by example uh, for our service member, no matter what service it is. Well, I'll tell you this, SMA, we, I live on Fort Meyer, and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the quarters up there on Jackson Avenue, right uh, across yeah, yeah, Patton yeah. Hall. But uh, on any given morning, I see the chief of staff of the Air Force, the chief of staff of the Army, getting after it. Is that you right? Know, I, <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, I just saw General McConville this morning running up cardiac hill right there on Jackson Avenue. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, that thing is a, it's a kick to the groin. But, uh, yeah, I see him out there, and uh, the troops see him as well. Yep. Uh, for us, senior enlisted, you know, the Sergeant Major of the Army, Tony Greenston, yeah. and I are always PTing around Fort Meyer. Yeah. So it's, it's a visible example of the expectations we have for the force. Yeah. And I believe in our senior enlisted ranks right now, we have people that are willing to just go ahead and follow me. You yeah. know, lead by example, not just give a bunch of lip service, but demonstrating to people this is why this is important. And if the old man can do it, how dare you do not? Yeah, yeah. I always tell people, you gotta show people what right looks like. Yeah. You know, if you sit back on your butt and don't do anything, then that's exactly what they'll do. Uh, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Uh, we'll be right, you're watching Your Next Mission video podcast. You're watching Your Next Mission, proudly presented by the Cavalry Agency. They help brands dominate no matter their size, ideas, Strategy, action, this is Cavalry. Learn more at Cavalry.com. Navy Federal Credit Union, the most trusted credit union owned by members of the military community, serving all branches of the armed forces and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Purdue Global, providing affordable online education for hardworking adults. Learn more about a personalized, innovative, and world-class education at purdueglobal.edu. Veterans United Home Loans, the number one VA lender for five straight years. If you're buying, they're funding your dreams. Learn more at veteransunited.com. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. Welcome back. We're blessed to be here today with the Senior Enlisted Advisor, Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I want all the vet viewers to reach out to me directly. Tell us, uh, tell us about your transition. Tell us what topics you'd like us to cover. It's not my show, it's, it's your show. It's, it's uh, help each other out here, and I'm gonna help you out. You can call or text me at 844-424-1134, and I'll actually reach back out to you. Or send me an email at uh, smatilly at yournextmission.org. Okay, let's 
let's pick it up where we left off here. We're, we're heading into the final segment with you today, and there's uh, still a lot to cover, and I want to talk about a lot more stuff with you. But I just, just have a couple more questions. I'd like us to shift the conversation to education for the enlisted force, which I know is a, is a major priority for you. How is your office tackling the charge uh, to build a, a more lethal joint uh, force from the education perspective? SMA, the, the lethal force that you speak about, we cover briefly when we were talking about our partners and the development that we're pushing forward for them. But in the future, a lethal force must be a thinking force. And we realized over the years that a lot of people talk about, you know, the say do gap, but very few people were talking about the no do gap. Um, we often educate our officers and train our enlisted. Now, over the course of the past 20 years, the enlisted force is, is more and more educated. We're talking, you know, four year degrees. We're talking masters. We're talking even PhDs. And we need to start bridging that gap on the amount of education that we provide our force along with their training to be the experts at their trade. So something that we immediately did upon assumption of responsibility for this position was have a round table with the service senior enlisted advisors and the advisor to the National Guard Bureau. And in that conversation, we sought to identify the gaps that we had in joint development to make sure that our education, when it comes to Keystone and uh, enlisted joint PME one and two, were worthy of people's times. One of the biggest telling signs that we found is uh, from the last round of professional military education to attendance to Keystone, was on average seven to 10 years. And that was a, a pretty sizable gap. Yeah, yeah. So we started looking back, walking the rounds back into, uh, into Target and uh, realized that we needed a bridge course at the E7 level to be able to go ahead and uh, put in uh, a few key topics on what the joint force does how the authorities are passed down, how the combatant commands operate, and how the services support those combat fighting missions of the combatant commands via their Title 10 responsibilities of manning, training, and equipping. So we created a course called Gateway, which right now is on the validation phase, uh, which is gonna take place here this December. We're ready to run the pilot course. We provided some adjustments, and now we're going to run the second course to validate the curriculum and then solidify it and put it forward to our people. But uh, we need to do a better job teaching people the why nowadays, especially with the new generation that is uh, always craving information. And back in the days when we were growing up, we will see it as borderline insubordination if you ask too many questions about the orders that were given to you. But that is really the, the nature of our youth. They're inquisitive because they can look, they can research anything. Back in the day, you and I had to go to some library, get the book and get the black and white so that we can challenge someone. Now they just <laughs> pull out their phone and, and they do it, you right. know? And it, it can create for humorous situations. Yeah. But the bottom line is, is that they're, they're thinking quite a bit and we need to feed that thinking uh, hunger that they have. So we're working really hard, not only on creating the joint PME courses that we need for the force to be able to make them effective on the battlefield, but also we need to create more opportunities when it comes to the Ivy League education that some of our officers get. Uh, myself and a few others have already attended Harvard, University of North Carolina, and we have opened the doors for people to be able to attend those courses. But something that I found out recently is that admission to some of these precious institutions are driven by the old Geneva Convention's uh, GS POW ratings yeah. to where an E9 caps out at GS7. So I had two senior NCOs recently, one that got accepted to uh, an institution here in DC and another one in Massachusetts that after they found out that there were both E8s, they said, well, the minimum requirement is a GS-13 or equivalent. And for this table we have, you're nothing more than a GS-7, so sorry you cannot come. One had a PhD, the other one had a master's. We got to do something about that. Yeah. You know, We're being constrained by rules that were created in the 1950s that no longer apply. And we just need to apply a new mindset in order to go ahead and change those rules. Yeah, it's really funny you say that because I remember when I first got out, uh, I went to it uh, down to El Paso and I was talking to, I was at a, a, a Sergeant Major Army's conference 
And I got up and said, hey, look, guys, just to let you know, most of you don't qualify for jobs in the government, you know, because of the restrictions, because of the people that are working in there. The other thing is, it, it's uh, from my perspective now, years ago, uh, we, we had a tremendous focus on the education development. It's taken us 10, 20, and then we had a war in the middle, but it's taken us a long time to, to build up that education. And just what you just said, a lot of cases, we have just as much education as our leaders in a lot of cases as far as uh, development and stuff. So it's, I'm really, for me personally, I just think it's a, it's a great thing. The other thing about that too in the education part of it, it prepares us for life after the military. Absolutely. You know, and it sort of works us in such a way that, uh, you know, we get out and, and, and again, you said it a minute ago, people think that uh, that you're right here, but in fact, you're way up here as far as development and leadership and all this stuff. Last thing, probably not the last thing I'll say, but it, it's amazing that uh, I went out to a company and I was uh, I was working, doing some stuff. And I said, if you get a senior list of non-commissioned officer, doesn't matter what service, they can do anything. Yep. And, and we and we hired a couple and, and man they said where do we hire more <laughs> you know so it's it's really good I think the honest the honest really would be interesting to hear about the purpose of the American warfighter their development and their principles and the commitment uh, can you elaborate just a little bit on that yeah so you know the the American warfighter is a, it's a select group everybody knows that we're the one percent of society that mm -hmm. decides to go ahead and carry on with this duty because it's not a job it's a duty and a calling um, the second that a young man or woman raises their right hand, I mean, they're making a lifelong commitment to the defense of the nation. Mm -hmm. And lifelong doesn't matter whether you serve two, four years, if you serve honorably, you will forever be a recruiter and a member of this club because that is really the way that we breed our people and the way that we breed excellence in our, in our ranks. Um, the discipline that you learn, the autonomy that you get, uh, all of the things that we put you when it comes to the service culture and those core values. Uh, and then you couple that with the, you know, expectation, the written expectation of character, competence, and commitment that you learn when you're serving in the armed forces is unparalleled to anything else. Yeah. But what that means, you know, the translation for the average person out there that has no experience with the military is that exactly what you just said, you can put us in any situation and we will make it work we will figure out a way because no, it's not in our vocabulary. I mean, or can do, we find a way. And if we cannot find a way, then we validate, we validate the impossibility of the situation. And then we try to find a way to get to the right course of action. Yeah, I, I used to tell, I mean, when I was uh, years ago, I was going into Bosnia and, and I had a guy named uh, uh, General Nash, Bill Nash was, a, was the commander. And I says, hey, sir, we're going into Bosnia. I said, here's what I'm going to do. The non-commissioned officers of our division is going to move the unit. Uh, I want you guys, the officers, to plan and to make sure that we're prepared to, uh, to do what we got to do. So it's, it's just, uh, we've went a long ways. We've got a lot farther to go, but, but I think we got to just stay focused in what we're doing because uh, we have a, uh, a great military uh, and we're doing a tremendous job. Uh, the, the other thing I'll tell you, I, I give some classes uh, on a, I've been blessed to do a lot of different things, but I give a class up in Baltimore, and the people I give the class to are, are young Americans, 18 to 24, and I start the class out by, by saying, I want you all to raise your hand up. And they all raise their hand up and say, just say, I will. And I get them all to say, I will. And I said, do you realize what you've just done? I said, you just enlisted, because I'm talking about Army, you just enlisted in the Army. And they also chuckle about that. And I said, well, I want you to understand something. You're willing to die in the defense of our country. You understand that? For the next hour, I'm going to talk to you. Think about the people that wear that uniform that said it's about protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. I'm willing to die for your freedoms. And I think that's one of the messages that, you know, everybody in the military knows that. But it bothers me sometimes because when you get out of the military, uh, they don't necessarily understand. I think maybe a lot of them do. Maybe a lot of them don't. But they don't understand the freedoms that they have because of what you guys do what we have done in the in the past and i think that's we got to continue to keep pouncing on that and say hey you know the the army or the military air force or whatever uh, our veterans our military does the things that uh, we need to do for our country to make it safe so uh, you know i just again i want to thank you for being on the show thank you for your your uh, you know participation i know you're a busy guy uh, i used to be in that pentagon i know how busy i was all the time <laughs> and how much i in fact i uh, I, I don't know about you, you probably travel a lot more. I traveled 800,000 miles when I was there and I was gone all the time. But, but I was always, I've always been and always will be proud of, uh, 
of the commitment of the military and what they did for me personally and what I tried to do while I was on the service. Any, uh, or in the service, any final thoughts, anything you want to share with the audience? Anything, you know, floor's always been years already, but anything you want to share with anybody that's listening? Well, SMA, the last thing that I would like to say is that for the, for the public, specifically that demographic that you just mentioned, the 18 to 24 years old, uh, don't forget that the defense of the nation is a generational commitment. Absolutely. And our generation has got to move out of the way and the next crop of valiant young men and women need to come out in the door. Now, uh, Americans tend to be very ahistorical. And a lot of it has to do with the comforts that we provide each other in the pursuit of that happiness, you know, in uh, support of the Constitution and fighting our wars. But here comes a time to where 76% of society cannot serve for reasons that they could have prevented. Um, and if you want to find a way to go ahead and pay back the nation that is actually providing those freedoms, come on in and join us. You know, find out what you can do when we unleash the potential that you have by putting some strict discipline in your daily routine. Find out what you can do with the education that you can get. Two years of honorable service gets you a four-year degree if you choose to do it via the GI Bill. And then look at what you can do with the confidence that you're going to have and the pride of being one of the few, the one percenters that are willing to roger up and raise their right hand and say, I will, like you did with that young uh, group of men and women. That is really what I would like to leave the audience with is that, you know, the defense of our nation is going to need sons and daughters. And it is our time right now to promote just that, that this is an institution to where you can get a lot of and that we can provide a lot in return to society as we rotate in and out of service. Yeah, I, I would tell you that, uh... Yeah, it's, it's, we've got such a, a great country, uh, and we just got to make sure that uh, we do the things that are right for this country to make it uh, free. It'll always be free, there's no question, but we, uh, but we need young men to, to step up to the plate, no, young men and women to step up to the plate and, and make sure we do, uh, we do what's right. And, and again, uh, again, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I know you're busy. and I, In fact, it's really bad. It's the first time I think I ever met you, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Shame on me. I go up there every once in a while. I should have come by and said, hey, but next time I come up there, well, are you going to? Next, next time come by, SMA, and uh, we'll love to uh, to have a deeper, deeper conversation about the current state of affairs. Oh, absolutely. And, and the other thing I'll tell you is uh, if I can ever help you in any way, I'm an easy guy to get a hold with. you got a hold of us now, but uh, if I can help you, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and stuff, put a lot of different information out. So if there's something I can share or help you out with, just send it to me. We'll we'll figure out a way to get out there and sort of. And we're starting to get a, I don't know if you know this or not, we're the number one military podcast in the country, according to Feedspot. Uh, we're, I think we're number nine on military. We're number like 14 on the on the veteran side of the house. So we're growing every day. And uh, we want to try to get our audience up. You know, this is sort of a goal, maybe three or 400,000 people. But uh, we'll do it, but it'll just, uh, it'll just take a while. Again, thank you so much. I appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you for having me, SMA. <laughs> Thanks to the Senior Enlisted Advisor, Ramon C.Z. Colon Lopez. And I tell you what, it's, here's, a, here's a true American that, uh, you know, just by listening to him, cares so much about our country and wants to do everything he can. So uh, I certainly appreciate it coming on the show. I'm Jack L. Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, and you've been watching your next mission video podcast. And, and thanks for watching today. Uh, please visit our website and on yournextmission.org and leave me a review. <laughs> I always say, I hope it's a good review, but if it's a, a bad one, I guess I could take it. You can also visit our partners there who can provide with so many services that will assist you in your transition from the military. Also, please visit our corporate partners there and see all the jobs that are available. Please know we want to assist you any way we can. I'm going to say that again. I always say it twice at least. Please know we want to assist you any way we can. Please follow me on all my personal social media channels. I never thought I'd ever say that, but I'm trying to connect. <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And if you enjoyed our discussion with uh, Senior Listener Advisor Ramon Colon Lopez, please like us. Click on that uh, subscribe button below. Don't forget, we want to hear from you. Please leave me a message or, or send me a text at 844-424-1134 or send me an email at uh, smatilly at yournextmission.org. Again, thanks again to the Senior Enlisted Advisor, Ramon Colon Lopez, for being with us today. It was, uh, it was really just great having him on the show. You need to get uh, senior leaders that, that step up and, and tell the story, tell the truth about stuff, and just sort of look in the eye. 
I always like to leave you with some with some final thoughts, and I think probably today it's going to be short because I think uh, he covered a lot of stuff. But I just want to say, uh, don't don't think you're by yourself. Uh, don't think you're by yourself out there moving around as a veteran and nobody nobody cares about you because we do care about you. And if you're not active duty and you're struggling with anything and you've got some issues and things aren't going right, talk to somebody. Uh, reach out and uh, and get somebody get some help. Uh, whether or not it's uh, you know you just feel you know, bothered or you don't feel comfortable about what you're doing. There's so many people out there that will assist you and they want to talk to you, they want to help and make sure those those families are involved. And probably the last thing I want to say, it's a great military, it's a great country we live in, but serve in the military. If you don't meet the standard right now, you can. If you're not physically fit, get physically fit. Because I guarantee you, if you join the military, it'll change your life. It'll make you a better person for the rest of your life. Again, thanks for watching and thanks to Cloudcast Media, New Mind Studios, and of course, our four presenting sponsors, Calvary Agency, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue University Global, and Veterans United Home Loans. We appreciate all they do for our veterans. Again, as always, see you on the high ground. hoo You've been listening to Your Next Mission, brought to you by the American Freedom Foundation. Learn more by visiting yournextmission.org.